Welcome to uh, everyone. Um, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Sisri Jayasuri. I'll be the moderator for this uh, webinar uh, on green, resilient, and inclusive development role of international trade. Um, this is uh, part of the series of uh, webinars that the Center for Development Economics and Sustainability at uh, Monash University has been holding since uh, last year. And uh, before we start the formal proceedings, uh, as is customary, I want to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which our four Australian campuses stand and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today's webinar, uh, the format is that uh, we have the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Mari Pangestu from the World Bank, uh, uh, who will make the initial presentation. Uh, and then uh, uh, Kim Anderson and Ian Cox said, uh, will uh, present some perspectives of their own, including some comments on uh, Mari's presentation. And then uh, it will be open for Q&A for the audience. Uh, the webinar today is uh, particularly uh, important. As you all know, uh, we are about to uh, uh, go forward to the uh, Glasgow uh, Climate Summit, uh, where a lot of people around the world are hoping, expecting, uh, certainly hoping that uh, we will see the kind of changes that will make the, the world sustainable, uh, both economically and environmentally. Uh, sustainable, and that uh, the path will be uh, cleared for a recovery from the pandemic uh, and for the long term uh, sustainable growth and sustainable in every way. So it also in, means inclusive uh, development uh, so that the gains from economic uh, growth and, and development will be distributed fairly across income groups, across countries, uh, developing, developed, uh, and other, uh, and, and, and genders and, and, and other groups. Um, as you know, this is uh, probably the most challenging time to be uh, talking about international trade uh, in this context. Uh, not since the 1930s has the, the global environment um, darkened so much for those who have been advocating and, and fighting for uh, a world where trade would be free and people would be able to uh, exchange goods, services, factors of production and do it all uh, in a way that is uh, environmentally and uh, socially sustainable. Um, we, since the end of the Second World War, we have seen steady progress uh, in terms of the world moving towards avoiding the kind of scenarios that characterized the world in the 1930s when uh, the world was gripped in, uh, in a depression. Uh, countries fought each other initially uh, in the trade uh, arena in particular uh, through uh, barriers to international trade, uh, rising tariffs, um, competitive devaluations, etc. And then the momentum of that kind of uh, non-cooperative uh, behavior ended up in the massive catastrophe of the Second World War. Uh, 
and the institutions that were developed during the uh, but during the Second World War, in fact, towards the end, were meant to avoid a repeat of that kind of uh, scenario. Um, but unfortunately, as uh, we are all aware, uh, the last couple of years in particular uh, have been in some ways uh, somewhat alarming in the way that uh, trade policy uh, issues have come back um, linked to uh, international so-called great power competition. Um, so in this, uh, you know, given this backdrop, uh, we are very, very uh, pleased that we have got three globally renowned authorities on international trade uh, and development. Uh, in this webinar, uh, who are also actively engaged uh, in shaping policy and who have been engaged in shaping policies and influencing policies in their own, uh, and, uh, initially in academia and then through uh, participation in uh, various in, uh, institutions, governments, uh, and, uh, and uh, global institutions. Uh, to discuss these issues today. Um, as we have already uh, described uh, briefly the, the, the bios of uh, our speakers, I wouldn't go into detail about those, but uh, Professor uh, Mari Pangestu, uh, you know, she's currently the Managing Director of uh, Development Policy and partnerships at the World Bank. Uh, she has an absolutely distinguished record, both as an academic and in the policy arena. Uh, she was uh, Minister of Trade and uh, in, in Indonesia and also held other portfolios and has participated in numerous international uh, organizations and fora and uh, is currently uh, heavily involved in trying to move the world uh, towards a path of uh, sustainable, inclusive uh, development uh, where trade policy would play a, a central role. Um, and Professor Kim Anderson is uh, Emeritus uh, uh, Professor, um, uh, George Carlin Professor at Adelaide University, and he has also been um, one of the leading uh, international trade academics, as well as uh, a participant in uh, shaping policy. Uh, the long record of uh, publications and uh, activities in this area. Uh, and Professor Ian Cox said, uh, Uh, Center for Demography and Ecology and uh, Department of uh, Applied Economics and at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison has also been an active uh, both in policy and in academia uh, in the trade and development uh, area, including a uh, focus on uh, trade and environment uh, issues and more generally. Um, on the broader issues of uh, uh, sustainable uh, development. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome uh, all of all three of you um, and thank you for accepting our invitation to be part of this. I know this is a you know it's a very very busy time for all of you, but uh, in particular for Mari, uh, who is right in the middle of. Uh, 24 seven meetings and, and uh, deliberations uh, and getting ready to go to Glasgow for the meetings. Um, the format would be, uh, uh, to, to repeat what I said early, Mari would go first, followed by uh, Kim and then by Ian and then Q&A. So please send your questions, uh, questions through the chat function and we will, 
uh, try to curate them and present them to the panel, consolidate them as necessary, and uh, present them to the panel uh, at the end of uh, uh, their presentations. Thank you, uh, Mari, if you could. Thank you, uh, Cicira, and thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with old friends, uh, Cicira, Kim, uh, Ian, and others. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, accept this invitation, uh, basically because I've learned that I can't say no to Cicira. So I'm very happy to be here uh, with all of you uh, today, or tonight, it's my tonight. Uh, and I just want to uh, talk to my presentation now. Uh, what I, uh, could you go to the ne next slide? What I intend to cover in uh, my presentation today is really uh, to assess the role that trade uh, can play uh, in a country's green, resilient and inclusive recovery and development. Uh, and I wanted to give, start with the current context. Uh, Sisira described uh, some of it already and uh, why uh, we think that a new development approach is needed and what does that uh, approach co co consist of and how trade uh, is a central part of that uh, solution. And then uh, conclude with uh, what would be the ne needed changes in trade regulation and policies. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, really, uh, we, we start with the uh, context of the twin challenges that we are facing today. Uh, basically, the twin challenges is, of course, COVID-19 and the uh, really uh, huge human lives cost, uh, economic cost, social cost uh, uh, that it, it's had uh, and how uh, COVID has accentuated actually the development challenges that the world had already faced, was already facing even uh, before the pandemic. So we are going to see extreme poverty rise. We are going to see uh, by, by around 100 million uh, by the end of this year, inequality will rise, jobs lost, uh, increased uh, debt, uh, stress uh, in developing countries, as well as a decline in natural capital and human capital. We, we are using the word scarring uh, for one of a better term. Uh, you know, the scarring that countries will uh, experience uh, like human capital losses, which are, uh, or uh, will, which will be very hard to actually reverse and can set back development uh, for, for even a decade uh, is, is what is kind of uh, a lot of the analysis that we are doing. And then you have the other crisis, which is the climate crisis. And if we, in the business as usual scenario, we are predicting that 130 million more people will uh, also uh, become, uh, will enter into extreme poverty. And the reason being that uh, a lot of the impact of climate change, uh, whether it's weather, uh, uh, increasing uh, frequency of, uh, of severe weather crisis and natural disasters, and the effect it also has on agriculture and so on, uh, really affects the poorest and most vulnerable in a country, as well as the poorest and most vulnerable countries. So it, it impacts uh, more on, on, uh, on, on the poor and vulnerable and uh, actually accentuates inequality. And then you have that the zoonotic nature of the virus itself, which is the intermingling, intermingling of human animals and the ecosystem. So uh, really uh, the science is unequivocal on this, that the consequences of climate change and pandemics are gonna be irreversible, ir irreversible and severe and with, with, which, which, uh, with huge costs on human lives, the economy, human capital, natural capital, and even social capital. So uh, we, we, we have always talked about the inter interdependence of people, planet, and the economy. But I think uh, COVID-19 and climate change has really starkly exposed this inter interdependence, which, next slide, which really uh, emphasizes why you need a new approach. A business as usual uh, recovery package would fail to address this inter interdependence. And if we don't get it right, we will uh, uh, have a, a lost decade of development for developing economies. Um, what we are what we are advocating is that, or promoting and also trying to work with countries uh, on this is that we can't address these global challenges, these crises in isolation. We need an integrated and coordinated uh, response. 
uh, if we continue on the current growth path, uh, we will have decline in natural capital, uh, which will affect the ecosystem and we will risk human capital losses, further human capital losses. And at the end, that will have uh, economic, uh, negative economic effects. So a new approach is needed, which we are calling the green, resilient and inclusive development or grid approach. Uh, there, there, you know, this is a link for you to read the paper. And uh, one of the key in implementation plans is the climate change action plan, which uh, we launched in, in May, which, is, which gets quite specific into how you can integrate climate uh, with development. Uh, what is new about this approach? Uh, first, uh, I think development practitioners have long talked about poverty, inequality, and environment ex externalities, such as uh, climate change, uh, but separately, not uh, sufficient focus is, has been undertaken on the interrelationships and the cross-sectoral nature of uh, development policy uh, and its link uh, to, uh, to uh, climate and environment. For instance, exports of agriculture products has a positive impact on the country and on farmers, but it can also be the cause of deforestation, which in the end uh, leads to floods uh, and will at the end hurt the poor. Second, what is uh, different is also that the grid approaches tackles the issues of sustainability, resilience, and inclusiveness simultaneously and systematically. Uh, it is simultaneously about creating jobs, uh, you know, new opportunities, new green products, markets, and investment, changing consumer behavior. Uh, so you have the economic growth uh, and the job creation, the inclusiveness, as well as addressing climate uh, challenges. Uh, third, we need uh, uh, the third different thing about this is that it needs to be tailored to country needs and uh, to their climate objectives. And uh, it needs to be sequenced, you need, you need to have sequence interventions tailored uh, to country needs. Uh, next slide. So that, that's in a nutshell what we are trying to uh, uh, call a, 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 an integrated approach that will address sustainability, resilience, and inclusiveness uh, in an integrated way. Uh, to achieve GRID, uh, to implement GRID, it will require large investments, not just in what we normally focus on, which is physical and financial capital, but also in human capital, uh, natural capital, uh, and, and social capital. And if you don't invest in, in all these uh, capitals, uh, you will not uh, get to your uh, green, resilient, and inclusive uh, development. Uh, and uh, uh, implementing grid, uh, next slide, please, also requires transformational actions and investments in key systems. This is uh, really the focus of our uh, uh, climate change action plan. Uh, that you have to have transformational investments in these key systems because they account for 90% of greenhouse gas uh, and, uh, and are also primary consumers and polluters of other scarce resources such as land and water. So we have energy, uh, agriculture, food and water uh, and land use within that uh, land uh, and cities, uh, infrastructure, urban infrastructure, transportation and manufacturing, especially hard to abate and uh, uh, high uh, carbon intensive industries such as steel uh, and cement. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, uh, have these uh, large scale investments in these key systems. And to do that, you basically need uh, to do uh, two, two major things. One is of course, you have to have the policy reforms and institutional strengthening, whether it's the fiscal uh, policies, such as reducing the, eliminating the subsidies such as fuel subsidies and agriculture fertilizer subsidies, repurposing them uh, for infrastructure or for uh, creating jobs and social uh, protection uh, and also carbon prices and taxes uh, within that to have the right incentive system and really have key upstream reforms and policies that will shape expectations and create the, these new opportunities when you talk about green investment and green jobs. For instance, you know, the, the phase out of coal, uh, which uh, some countries have already adopted, or that you're going to have 50% of your transportation using electric vehicles. You know, th those uh, commi commitment, long-term commitment, as well as carbon pricing, uh, will uh, create the expectations. 
And then within that, you need to have a just transition policy to address the social and labor market uh, policy adjustments that will happen when you have these transitions. So uh, uh, to do all that, you need investment and you need financing. So how much of that will come from a government budget? How much of that will come from private financing? And uh, there will need to be exceptional international support. So uh, this 100 billion number that has often been referred to uh, it's probably not enough. If you look at the calculations as how much is going to be needed, it's actually going to be more than a hundred billion, uh, but there will be a needed, needed exceptional support, uh, international support, whether it's grants or, or concessional loans. And then you need to, the rest of it will have to come from uh, private finance. Uh, and here is the innovative financing, the guarantees, the concessions, the de-risking instruments, and so on. This is the whole discussion that we're going to be having uh, in, in Glasgow. So uh, let me stop there. That was just a, 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 to put you in the context of what we are talking about. And let me now go to the role of trade uh, uh, in, uh, in this green, resilient, and inclusive recovery. Um, let me just start with, um, next slide. Uh, let me just uh, start with uh, what we all know and what we have all been I suppose the last three decades, uh, all, of, all of us uh, trade uh, people, we, we have been working on the premise that uh, trade is good. Uh, trade is good for countries, trade is good for uh, globally. Uh, and there's a consensus that trade contributed to growth uh, and, uh, and re reduction in poverty. So developing countries increased their share of global exports from 16 to 30%. And poverty uh, also uh, declined from 36% to 9% uh, over the last uh, three decades. So uh, trade has really uh, led to growth, reduced poverty and increased uh, shared prosperity. Uh, and it's based on efficiency, comparative advantage, specialization, and all the export oriented development model uh, of development that was uh, very much central to uh, a lot of developing countries in the 70s and 90s evolving production networks and then uh, global value chains. Next slide. Uh, and so trade has been this catalyst for economic growth uh, and poverty reduction. And this is all empirical evidence about how an increase in uh, exports does lead to uh, increased employment and average wages, uh, as well as uh, reducing infor informality uh, and help women transition into the formal sector. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, but we know, uh, I think uh, Cicera uh, mentioned some of it, what we've seen since the global financial crisis is a decline in the support for trade. And the multilateral trading system has been in retreat, as we know, due to geopolitical tensions, especially in the last four or five years. Uh, the major economies who used to champion uh, the multilateral trading system have withdrawn. And uh, we, we are, uh, despite the, the changing uh, the changing environment uh, in, in, in the US at least, uh, trade issues are still not yet uh, totally back on the multilateral front. Uh, and uh, uh, also the, the perception that trade benefits have not been distributed equitably across countries has, has also been uh, a, a factor that led to the declining support for trade. And this is not just in developing countries, Obviously, uh, in countries, in developed countries, uh, US, Europe, uh, this has also played out, even though uh, perhaps the, the, the evidence shows uh, that it has mainly been because of technology, job losses and declining regions where sectors have declined have been more to, due to technology rather than trade. Yet, uh, obviously, trade still gets a, a lot of the, the, the flack. And having been a trade minister before, uh, but basically, uh, it's, it's, it's what you can see, and it's actually uh, policies that can be used easily are trade policies. You know, it's easy to put on a tariff or a protectionist measure. It's much harder to, to have a long-term plan on increasing productivity. So uh, it, it's just the way uh, the political economy of trade works. And trade has also been blamed uh, for uh, contributing to climate change, whether it's deforestation, or increased carbon uh, uh, emissions. But yet, despite these challenges, trade is now, uh, we want to argue, more central than ever before, especially when we want to talk about uh, uh, a green, resilient, inclusive uh, recovery. 
uh, we, we have seen how trade uh, has played a crucial role uh, in, in the access to food, medical supplies, and in the production and distribution of vaccines. We are still experiencing it. And how uh, trade restrictions, uh, at, uh, on the other hand, have also uh, led to uh, perhaps unequitable access in some uh, instances. And uh, fortunately for food, uh, we did, you know, there were some food restrictions at the beginning of the pandemic, but that seems to have uh, calmed down and it did not lead to uh, higher food prices. Higher food prices, nevertheless, is a big issue now, not necessarily because of the export restrictions, but because of uh, other uh, costs uh, going up and uh, as well as some weather related uh, production disrupt dis disruptions and uh, logistics and delivery disruptions. And uh, trade has been uh, actually uh, contributing to the recovery. Uh, trade re rebound, uh, trade uh, fell uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, but within six months, it, it rebounded and uh, seemingly uh, continues to be an engine of economic growth. Next slide. So the, the most recent numbers uh, tell us that uh, within six months, uh, trade rebounded and actually uh, at the end of last year, trade was at a higher level than pre-pandemic and has continued uh, to grow. Uh, and it, but the, the growth, just like the uneven growth story that's been uh, of major concern, also trade recovery was uneven with those countries which are linked to market integration and GVCs recovering faster uh, and East Asia and Pacific uh, region being uh, central to that and many other regions still having a negative uh, export growth. Um, at the moment, our uh, trade forecast is 9.7% uh, for 2021, so it's, it's a you know, sharp rebound, and 6.7% for 2022. But these forecasts are being dampened by uh, shipping and logistics disruptions that we are seeing increasingly uh, of late, and seemingly they, they might continue into 2022. And because uh, East Asia is the one region that is experience, experiencing Delta variant and slow vaccine rollouts, uh, uh, it can also affect the global value chains. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, uh, the recovery uh, is showing you that openness and market uh, integration remain critically important. Uh, next slide. So uh, going forward, uh, how do we have regulation uh, and policies in trade that not only yield high growth, but a development that is green, resilient, and inclusive, because you know, if, you, if we recall the context of the decline in support for trade, uh, it, it has uh, uh, these elements, uh, uh, lack of uh, equal distribution um, and uh, trade being blamed for climate and so on. So how do we uh, look at these three aspects, green, resilient, and inclusiveness, and how trade contributes to each? Next slide. Let's start with green. Um, I was gonna wear green actually, I forgot to wear green. <laughs> a trade can contribute to a green economy. Uh, so while trade uh, uh, has often been blamed uh, for you know, emissions, uh, you know, freight uh, is, is being blamed uh, for contributing, transportation is being blamed for uh, contributing to, um, uh, to emissions. Uh, trade can also be a part of the solution to addressing climate change. Uh, and it can enhance mitigation and adaptation uh, as well. Um, and uh, we had, uh, at, at the back of this presentation, you will see later, uh, the World Bank has just released a, a report on trade and climate change. And so the, the results here are coming uh, from that uh, report. report. Uh, first, uh, it can foster the spread of environmental goods and services that will reduce emissions. You can talk about weather resistant seed varieties that will help uh, farmers uh, deal with drier weather or less water uh, to parts and services in re renewable energy like wind turbines and solar panels. Uh, and uh, an example here is a country like Bots Botswana, which has a lot of sunlight, but access to solar panels uh, uh, distribution uh, is 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 not uh, is not uh, 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 being done there because of the continued uh, subsidies on fossil fuels and high trade costs. 
uh, as well as the tariffs, high uh, trade barriers uh, on, uh, on environmental goods and services. Uh, trade can also facilitate the transfer of climate friendly technologies uh, through investment uh, and trade. Um, and, and, uh, and lastly, I think uh, we, we need to really, uh, this is the way we are making the argument for, uh, for many of the countries that we are working with that, uh, you know, because making the argument about integrating climate to development or asking uh, countries to think about climate uh, challenges because it's going to have a, reduce your growth uh, and uh, have impact on, and, on health productivity and human capital in the future, uh, sometimes it does not resonate, resonate too much because they say, I have my, my challenges of creating jobs right now uh, and dealing with development issues. So we have found that uh, uh, coming at it from a competitiveness angle uh, sometimes resonates better. That uh, uh, going green uh, and having good uh, NDCs and long-term low carbon str uh, development strategies will actually uh, define your competitiveness in the future. That because export competitiveness is increasingly going to be affected by uh, carbon content. You can uh, talk about policy responses uh, to changing uh, climate, which are gonna affect exports and uh, growth opportunities for developing countries. You can take exporters of fossil fuels. Uh, right now with high commodity prices, maybe the argument is a little bit hard to make, but you know, eventually, if you talk, if, if countries are going to be serious about coal exit or fossil fuel, uh, you know, uh, removing the use of fossil fuels, the demand for uh, coal and fossil fuels obviously uh, will will decline. Uh, and then you have uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanisms being introduced by countries like EU. So countries which have already uh, which already have uh, targets and uh, long term uh, decarbonization strategies. Uh, will want to have a level playing field and they will want to tax countries that, or, or, or countries or products that don't uh, have the same uh, level of, um, of carbon, uh, carbon, uh, carbon, uh, lowering carbon uh, content. So sustainable supply chains uh, will be key uh, across the whole value chains. So how do countries then have uh, go, go towards diversification away from uh, carbon intensive sectors. Uh, and so the trade and investment patterns are going to be changing uh, because of this. Uh, and, uh, and this is the key uh, that will be uh, also where trade can contribute to the green economy. Next slide. So in terms of policies, uh, what uh, should be done uh, to achieve this uh, barriers to exports of environmental goods and services uh, need to be lowered whether it's tariffs on environmental goods, which are often higher uh, than other goods, uh, or tariffs for high, uh, are also higher for environmentally preferable products uh, of interest to developers, which include uh, agriculture and uh, natural goods. Uh, and where tariffs on environmental goods are low, uh, oftentimes uh, non-tariff measures like standards and certification can be restrictive. So uh, this also needs to be addressed, not just the tariffs, but also the tariff measures. And most importantly, it's not just about tariffs and non-tariff measures, but restrictions on services uh, all be uh, reduced because environmental services uh, uh, play a, a huge role. You can import the technology, but if you don't import uh, the human capital and talent that, that is needed to make the technology work effectively, you will also not, not get the benefit uh, of that environmental uh, goods. So that's uh, really uh, a key. Uh, a second, uh, this not on this slide. Second, we we need to uh, uh, remove the the tariffs and non-tariff barriers, which are biased towards the imports of high carbon intensive uh, industries or dirty goods. So we tend to have uh, lower tariffs and non-tariff barriers on the, the clean final, uh, on the uh, upstream uh, dirty goods uh, and uh, higher tariffs on the clean downstream goods. And this actually subsidizes uh, CO2 emission. So we need to uh, address that. Uh, and the third issue is uh, related to this uh, and the sustainable supply chain is how can we uh, uh, ensure that uh, the carbon content, the carbon tracing uh, mechanisms and tracking that's going to come about uh, 
is, is not going to disadvantage developing countries or SMEs. So there needs to be, uh, you know, uh, we need to ensure that the policies and tools and institutions are there for developing countries uh, to meet this and also how to uh, have the capacity building for SMEs. And uh, most importantly, in the multilateral rulemaking on trade in environmental goods and services, developing countries need to be part of it. Whether it's how do you measure carbon intensity, green standards, carbon pricing, and uh, issues around access to green technology. Um, and finally, I think the role of the WTO is, is really key uh, in all this, as well as uh, the role of regional uh, integration or economic cooperation, where um, you know, the, the issues such as environment uh, need to be uh, addressed uh, in, in there. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. So resilience, green now resilience. We want trade, uh, the role of trade in increasing resilience to shocks uh, uh, first of all, uh, keeping markets open has been critical to, uh, for coping with health and food shocks and natural disasters, and it facilitates economic recovery. And not having markets open, as we saw in, with the vaccines and in, with the food uh, crisis in 2008, uh, did actually uh, make the shock, uh, it, uh, have led to larger shocks. Um, and uh, improved trade governance and closer international cooperation really is needed uh, to scale up the production and distribution of medical goods. This is really something that uh, we are uh, in, heavily involved in working with countries and the WTO itself, uh, you know, issues of a temporary waiver on patents of vaccine production, uh, issues around technology uh, transfer, and, uh, and, and, you know, whether all countries should be producing vaccines given the, the criticality of, of, the, of the need, as well as the fact that there's a concentration of production. These are issues that we are uh, discussing now, but we need to come up with sensible solutions, obviously. Uh, trade facilitation uh, will also uh, improve, will help trade, resi will help resilience uh, to shocks because it will reduce the cost of doing trade and allow uh, trade diversification and uh, participation in global value chains. Uh, a recent, another recent study by the bank on trade costs uh, uh, shows that tariffs is a small percentage of trade costs of only 1 14th. The two other big uh, costs are uh, non excessive non-tariff measures uh, or unnecessary non-tariff barriers and a uh, very complex uh, board, at the border measure, whether it's customs or complex procedures. So, uh, an easy uh, costless stimulus, which we also did in 2008 when I was uh, in response to the global financial crisis, uh, is to just simplify, streamline, uh, use digital technology to really uh, simplify uh, that uh, trade cost. The other trade cost will take time because it's logistics inefficient ports and infrastructure, and it's uh, brought home by uh, today uh, we are still uh, looking at how shipping and logistics is providing is disrupting uh, value chains and the, and and delivery of goods. Uh, you know everybody's worried about not getting their Christmas gift in time uh, this year. Um, and finally, uh, the big debate right now that we are seeing that we really need to have a discussion. I'd be very interested to know uh, others' views on this. Uh, uh, open trade. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's a big discussion now about uh, resilience versus efficiency of global value chains. Uh, in the past, we focus on efficiency. You produce where it's the most efficient location uh, and source from there and distribute to the rest of the world. But with the disruptions of the global value chains uh, and also with, uh, you know, concentration of critical goods production, there is a, a revival of a discussion. Okay, we need to be more resilient not just efficient in the way we look at the global value chains. Uh, and, and how do we um, how do we approach this? You know, countries are talking about uh, onshoring, reshoring, uh, nearshoring, uh, and uh, we need to have everything produced nationally, especially for the critical goods. Uh, and so uh, 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 we are having a re-emergence of perhaps uh, industrial policy, picking winners kind of argument. Uh, the answer is really diversification, uh, and that has a lot to do with the policies uh, that are in place. It's also to do with uh, better connectivity, and connectivity is not just in the physical sense of the logistics, but also how agile and how adaptable are uh, production as well as uh, distribution. Uh, 
in, in the near future. So it's not just governments, obviously, but companies need to be more agile. And then finally, trust. And that's where the governance around the production uh, and trade and distribution of critical goods need to be in place. And this is the big debate we're having now uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the WTO. There's a multilateral task force on vaccines, therapeutics, uh, and diagnostics. And there's WTO, WHO, uh, World Bank, and IMF. And that's uh, one of the big issues. And it's also in the G20 health and finance ministers discussion. Uh, finally, um, I think I'm slightly over my 30 minutes. Uh, finally, uh, in inclusiveness. Next slide. Finally, inclusiveness. Uh, this is not a new issue. Uh, making sure trade uh, uh, is uh, the gains from trade is is evenly spread is not a new issue. But how we really need to hone down and and uh, focus on how can we get this right? How can we make sure that workers benefit uh, and industries and regions uh, that are lagging uh, because of uh, uh, their uh, sector uh, is no longer competitive? Uh, you know, you can talk about like uh, in, in the climate change transition, you know, from a coal region uh, to a clean energy region. Uh, these are issues that will, will be uh, very important for us uh, to address uh, because otherwise uh, we will not have the support for trade uh, and, and uh, it undermines the public support for trade. So it's not just about the right thing to do, but also making sure that we get the public support uh, for trade. Uh, whether it's about women workers, uh, female-led firms, SMEs, and workers that are in, in, in those regions and sectors. Our studies uh, on trade and distribution, uh, we have also just done a recent study on trade and distribution, shows that shocks tend to be long-lasting and geographically concentrated. And once again, uh, uh, we found that uh, inclusiveness will require uh, better complementary policies. And uh, to help those losing out policies that we that uh, reduce labor uh, mobile uh, uh, that uh, reduce labor mobility rigid rigidities in labor mobility will be important, including migration within a country or between countries. Skills and uh, gender uh, skills uh, upgrading, uh, focusing on also on the gender uh, aspects uh, of of the uh, of making sure that women uh, workers and female-led firms uh, are paid attention to, accelerating digital transformations so it reaches the poor. And actually, there's a big debate uh, whether you have to have specific uh, adjustment policies or broad adjustment policies like what you have uh, in the US. Specific and targeted uh, uh, may work better, uh, and, and that may be something that we need to, to look at. So uh, finally, uh, let me just close with uh, re next slide by re-emphasizing the message that openness and inter integration are still needed for countries' economic recovery, but policymakers will need to develop different trade policies than before so that we are not just focusing on economic growth, uh, but also how to make sure the benefits are shared uh, more widely. And we really, uh, the challenge for us ahead is how to make trade as, as part of the solution in developing a sustainable uh, economy including uh, you know, responding to uh, all the challenges and changes uh, on policies as well as our own uh, domestic challenges to, to meet the climate change goals. And there will need to be uh, a, you know, a, a very uh, clear policy uh, that will uh, address the, the workers and the transitions that's going to happen uh, if you are going to achieve a green, resilient and inclusive development pathway. Okay, let me stop. I'm sorry, I went, I think, five minutes over, over my allocated time. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you're taking five minutes extra. It was a broad canvas, uh, and uh, you looked at uh, a huge range of issues, uh, pretty much covering all the uh, issues of global recovery, of which trade comes as a part. Uh, so I'll go in uh, to save time uh, i will uh, invite kim uh, to come online now and uh, and and comment on the presentation and uh, present his own perspectives good thank you uh, thank you cicero i think we've uh, can you see my slides now 
Yes. Good. Uh, it was a great pleasure to to join this um, this session. Thank you, Marie, for those uh, uh, words and to give us an update on where the World Bank is thinking about uh, in terms of trade. Um, I thought uh, I could comment briefly on uh, two things. One is that uh, in addition to standard sort of risky shocks that the world faces, there's also um, greater trade and policy uncertainty these days, which uh, has to be built into how uh, market participants and governments um, uh, deal uh, with changes in the world economy. And secondly, to just build a little on uh, comments you made about agriculture, it certainly faces uh, challenges going forward, but it also has opportunities, I think, to contribute to uh, greener and more inclusive, as well as more resilient uh, development um, globally. In, the, in terms of uh, greater uncertainty, those of you who have read um, Richard Baldwin's recent books, you'll see how he shows that the digital revolution uh, has brought about faster and less predictable and less equal outcomes from globalization than we've, uh, we've seen in the past. And that has been part of the reason, I think, that we've seen this uh, anti-globalization uh, movement that has led to populism in politics. So that's important, but also I think things have changed a lot with respect to China's role in the world. It's, it's certainly been a major gainer from globalization over the past three decades. Um, and it's now joined the European Union and the US in terms of uh, being one of the world's three biggest traders. But under the current president, it is becoming uh, more assertive and less reliable as a trading partner. And that's causing uh, uh, confusion and adjustment for various other countries. Um, climate change obviously has been a, a, an important part of uh, this um, uh, current environment and there is the uncertainty about policies and about technology responses to climate change uh, that is um, um, something that we have to live with at the moment and this is especially harmful to uh, agriculture and especially to tropical agriculture and with uh, COVID reminding us that um, disease epidemics are becoming more frequent. Um, it's partly a result of globalization, movement of people and goods and so on, uh, and partly a result of climate change. And of course, we've got the pandemic to deal with at this uh, current moment, the COVID pandemic. So all of this requires greater multilateral cooperation uh, if we're going to improve global welfare. It's not only in terms of trade and the WTO plays its role there, but also in terms of the environment, um, and it's not just climate change, it's also biodiversity, and of course, human health, where the WHO is important, but I understand its budget is about equal to the budget of Stanford University's medical school. So it's a, it's a tiny operation at this stage. Um, but just when we need greater uh, multilateral institutional strengthening and cooperation, we've had, uh, the EU struggling through its own uh, Brexit event and then uh, populist member states that are uh, causing difficulties for it. And the US with its uh, previous populist president has weakened US uh, hegemony, uh, triggered these tariff wars and undermined uh, the WTO, IPCC and WHO among other international institutions. Um, but more broadly, the world has more populist governments uh, in the past decade than it had in any previous decade prior to uh, through to back to uh, 1900. Uh, this recent paper charts these changes. You can see the countries involved in the left and the leaders involved on the right of the chart. But most notably is the uh, emphasis or the, the number of uh, uh, governments that are in um, populist uh, regimes at the moment uh, in this past decade, uh, the, the large number of dashes on the right hand side of the chart and the colored differences are left wings versus right wing populists uh, and they seem to be equally represented. Well, what populism leads to is uh, among other things, economic nationalism and uh, protectionism. Um, and we've seen that already happen, uh, for example, uh, since the global financial crisis, the value of world trade that is facing new measures that reduce imports, net of those that have been removed, has been increasing uh, over this um, 
past decade or so. We've also seen that there is policy uncertainty and uh, that's been uh, rising. It rose during the global financial crisis, but it's been rising again since uh, 2016. So um, uh, this is just the environment in which we now have to work. The solution that seems to me is that um, there's mainstream members of political parties need to become as adept at winning votes as populists have become. And uh, I think that's a, a challenge because social media makes it easier to, for populists to exploit um, uh, the voting community by bifurcating them. Um, and more specifically, the fake news that is out there on social media uh, uh, that is uh, of an anti-globalization uh, uh, slant has to be, uh, has to be countered. Um, but it has to be counted not in the standard ways of saying free trade is good for the world, uh, full stop, but with more of a grid emphasis of the sort that Murray has just outlined. Well, thinking of agriculture uh, to become greener and more resilient, uh, more inclusive, um, agriculture has to be part of this solution because it accounts for a quarter of more than a quarter of global employment still. It's three quarters of global poverty. It's more than a third, about 38%, I think, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It is responsible for setting off a lot of uh, uh, epidemics, and it's a key contributor along with uh, deforestation to uh, biodiversity loss. And of course, COVID has now pushed uh, many uh, poor informal sector workers back to rural areas, which is raising that rural poverty uh, incidence even more. Um, and in the meantime, of course, we've still got policy, standard policies in place, and agriculture has many anti-trade policies, in fact, more so than other sectors. Um, it's true that import tariffs have been coming down over the past 25 years, but they're still very high for agriculture, and the average ag agricultural uh, tariff for developing countries is well above that for uh, high-income countries. Uh, we think of high-income countries as the ones that distort agriculture, but uh, so to do developing countries. They have lots of uh, tariffs and non-tariff measures in place that inhibit agricultural trade. Um, if you broaden the concept of uh, distortions to include all sectors, uh, including the exporting parts of agriculture, uh, then you can look at the overall um, agricultural assistance rate for farmers, the nominal rate of assistance. And uh, while that has gone down for the OECD countries, that's the black uh, lines in this chart, um, especially since the 90s, it's hard. Uh, meanwhile, a number of uh, developing countries, emerging economies, have been raising their uh, positive assistance and are uh, now starting to match, um, uh, getting close to those for the OECD countries for some of the East Asian uh, emerging economies. At the same time, we've seen since uh, the Uruguay Round completion, um, re-instrumentation of agricultural tariffs that have been bound and reduced, uh, re-instrumented to various forms of agricultural uh, domestic support measures, um, and so the reductions in tariffs is um, is um, not quite the that the extent of assistance to agriculture is not declining as much as the fall in tariffs might imply. In the case of the U.S., for example, um, domestic subsidies have risen from eight to fourteen percent of farm income uh, during uh, the period 2017 to 2019. And uh, some new research we've just done leading into the uh, World Trade Organization's uh, trade ministerial later in November um, had looked at uh, the extent to which agricultural subsidies contribute to the global welfare costs of distortions to, of, to farmer incentives. And when we did this at the launch of the Uruguay round, it was uh, those agricultural subsidies were responsible for just 5% of the distortion cost of farmer policies. Uh, currently, they're closer to 8%. Um, as well as that, with uh, looking at those long run trends, we need to look at the fluctuations around uh, trend. And uh, what we saw uh, and what research showed in the time of the uh, global financial crisis 
was that um, food prices uh, tend to, um, uh, when they spike, uh, governments tend to alter their restrictions to trade. Uh, but the research showed that that really doesn't contribute very much to uh, poverty. That might even con might even add to poverty, and it simply raises uh, international food prices further. And conversely, when international prices slump, and as Marie mentioned, that hasn't been so much an issue during the COVID uh, period. It, it was uh, back in 2020 for a little while, but I think governments had learnt that this isn't a sensible thing to do uh, during uh, uh, price spikes. Um, but we are seeing another food price spike now, so it uh, still remains to be seen whether this uh, uh, happens further as we go forward. Uh, and um, the food price spike is coincident with the energy price rise, that is a fossil fuel energy price rise, um, and it's exacerbated by that because we have biofuel subsidies still in place, uh, which uh, trigger the diversion of food towards biofuels when energy prices of fossil fuel prices rise. So we're back really to the um, same level of uh, world food prices, international food prices now in real terms as we had during the global financial crisis. Uh, well, where to for here multilaterally, um, as with uh, COVID and climate change and biodiversity, so it is with trade that we do need more multilateral cooperation if we're going to get optimal global solutions. And we do need to be reminded, and thankfully we have a new uh, paper coming out in the Handbook of International Economics by Bob Steger, which uh, shows that WTO not only provides a good set of rules and disciplines and dispute settlement procedures for that purpose, but that in this current environment with uh, increased globalisation and so on, it is still uh, a, a very good uh, institution to have in place. Uh, but uh, during the COVID period, there have been uh, large numbers of subsidies provided to industries, including agriculture, but obviously lots of other industries as well. And so those need to be monitored as we move out of the, this COVID period to ensure they don't remain there and uh, lead to further trade uh, tensions in the future. Uh, and the uh, dispute settlement body, which was um, uh, became... Uh, inactive in recent years because of the US not supporting it, supporting new uh, panellists coming in, uh, that certainly needs to be strengthened going forward as well. Uh, how else can agriculture contribute to, uh, to GRID? Um, well, it's uh, always been one of the stumbling blocks in international trade negotiations, and it was during the Doha round as well. Um, and so what is needed is uh, more agricultural tariff cuts, bringing stronger disciplines to agricultural domestic support, and, uh, and a ban on agricultural exports uh, restrictions in the same way as we have a ban on agricultural export subsidies. A new Pathways uh, paper has just come out uh, to contribute to that, and one hopes that the WTO Trade Ministerial, starting in late November, that some progress might be made there, uh, at least on the domestic support side. Nationally, uh, reform at the trade or the border requires complementary uh, reforms domestically to deal with the adjustments associated with that. Um, and uh, the repurposing of uh, current subsidies to agriculture is one way of doing that by providing more rural public goods that can contribute to reducing poverty and inequality within uh, developing countries in particular. Uh, it may be necessary that, uh, that income supplements are needed for the poorest households, but these days they can be done um, with decoupled income uh, support, just using generic uh, social safety net or trampoline uh, mechanisms. Um, that's possible in a way now that wasn't a, a decade ago because we've seen this massive increase in the extent to which households have access to uh, uh, mobile money accounts or bank accounts uh, right throughout the developing countries, though, quickly speeding up towards what we see in high income countries. And that makes it possible for governments to make very efficient transfers to individual households uh, rather than the vastly more inefficient mechanisms that have been used in the past. And finally, how else can agriculture contribute in? Well, if uh, the optimal policy was introduced, namely taxes on greenhouse gas emissions around the world, we wouldn't have so much of an issue. But when we've got unequal uh, 
imposition of those uh, um, taxes, then uh, we have this possibility and the European Union is leading it to bring in um, carbon border tax adjustments to the imports from countries with lower rates of taxation on those emissions. And that will hurt agriculture, especially uh, if uh, methane and nitrous oxide are included uh, because they are a major contributor to those two parts of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so it's a real challenge to agriculture to deal with that. And one of those ways that is emerging is for carbon farming, various ways of, um, of um, um, sequestering farming uh, carbon into, uh, into agricultural and forest land. So let me finish there, just to point out again that uh, international trade and in carbon credits will assist that process and more agricultural R&D will be needed to find out efficient ways to do this carbon farming and to providing payments for ecosystem services that farmers offer. Thanks, Isra. Thanks, Kim. Um, uh, yeah, uh, in order to save time, I'll go straight over to uh, Ian. Ian, if you could come on, please. Yeah, hi, Cicero. Thank you very much. And uh, let me go straight to sharing my screen here and hopefully this will work. Uh, you can see that okay? Uh, yes, your video is uh, closed, I think. Um, let me try that again. How's that? Right, right. That's good. good. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Murray, for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, and thank you, Kim, for an equally interesting talk. And also thank you, Kim, for choosing subject matter, which is orthogonal to my own, so we can uh, have a more diverse uh, set of topics to cover. A uh, uh, couple of points from Mari's presentation I just want to pick up on. Uh, I think the one we all know, but it's uh, also very important to remember, is that all kinds of capital, in her words, are going to be involved in establishing inclusive and uh, resilient and indeed green growth as well. And uh, she mentioned human capital. Uh, I want to mostly concentrate my attention uh, on that human capital question. Uh, uh, Murray also concluded with questions about policies and in particular pol uh, emphasized policies that are inclusive by reducing barriers to labor mobility, uh, both in terms of uh, migration possibilities or job change and also across the skill spectrum. And that's indeed where my uh, remarks will also uh, conclude. So uh, let me get straight to it. Uh, this is a very selective discussion. I'm going to talk very little about, actually not at all, about the environment, but much more about trade, and in particular about the role of, uh, let me try to advance this, it doesn't want to advance. Okay. Uh, uh, particularly about the role of uh, uh, global value chains. So clearly, uh, the need for uh, grid type growth is a first order policy measure. And clearly, also the role of trade is very central to this. Uh, no one's questioning the gains from freer trade, but the uh, but the very recent move towards uh, what we now call global value chains uh, is uh, obviously positive, but the gains and not so uh, uh, well established, at least empirically, relative to the old school way of thinking about trade with vertically integrated uh, industries within countries. So GF GVC participation is pretty new, uh, at least in our lifetimes, and, uh, and has some unique characteristics. And then the question is, well, you know, how is this going to uh, translate into different kinds of development uh, possibilities? And I think the very uh, the, to, I guess, uh, prefigure the conclusions that I'll reach. Uh, everything that's written about GVCs says, okay, the old way of thinking about trade was a lot about backward linkages and the kind of industrial promotion uh, efforts that they, would prom that they would facilitate. What's really special about GVC participation seems to be in almost everything that's written about it, that it will result in the creation and the international transfer simultaneously of uh, what the World Bank calls know-how, uh, I guess, uh, skills, opportunities for skills, knowledge that can be applied in productive ways. So the link from GVC participation, especially in low-income countries whose current uh, GVC configuration is mostly around final assembly with uh, low-skill, low-tech activities, uh, that link uh, really uh, seems most uh, robust or at least most important uh, 
when it comes to the transfer and the creation of, of new knowledge. So I think that's the criterion against which we had to evaluate it and which, against which its potential to contribute to resilient and inclusive growth uh, should be evaluated. So um, uh, what do we know about the GVC, especially in low income countries and late arrivals to development? Uh, well, the benefits are, are I think well known that this will, that joining GVCs means uh, potential for process and product innovations, functional upgrading, chain upgrading, meaning uh, that uh, activities spread out from, uh, from final assembly to other kinds of industries, especially service sector industries, which are connected to those industries. Obviously, uh, uh, GVCs attract capital. Uh, they may also have other spillover benefits like allocative efficiency, pro-competitive effects, and they may indeed uh, result in the transfer of know-how to developing countries. But the empirical results, such as they are, such as we have, uh, reveal a great deal of heterogeneity in the uh, the quote at the bottom of this slide here, which I won't read, um, uh, under, underlines that. This is from one of the very few, I think, rigorous and, and pretty complete uh, sets of uh, empirical studies evaluating development gains from GVC sectors. A lot of ambiguity and uh, not a whole lot of assurance that lower income countries are gonna be part of that process, at least not yet. Uh, sorry if I sound gloomy about all of this. That's just my natural disposition, as, as those who know me uh, know very well. Uh, so I want to uh, use my remaining time to ask two kinds of questions. One is, well, what do we see in terms of transfers of usable know-how? Uh, how robust are the claims for that? And then secondly, uh, I want to uh, stress some kind of longer term and dynamic concerns about the interactions between GVC participation and education, which is, of course, uh, the creation of know-how and so is vital to this story. So on the uh, on the industrial upgrading, the know-how story, uh, our expectation is that developing countries, low-income countries will graduate somehow from assembly to OEM to own equipment manufacturing, that is essentially backward linkages, and of course uh, also onto the more service sector driven part of the manufacturing process, uh, sometimes called own brand manufacturing as well. So uh, creation of downstream and upstream jobs uh, growing out of the initial engagement with mainly assembly type low skill uh, uh, activities. Um, how well does the reality uh, line up with these, uh, I'm going to call them aspirations. I'm going to focus mainly on the countries that I know something about, which is Southeast Asia. And to save time, let me uh, direct your attention to the right hand diagram here. The left one uh, merely confirms uh, increasing shares of exports and GDP with a question mark about what's been happening in Malaysia. But the right-hand one uh, is a, a set of measures of the skill to unskilled labor ratio and value added of exports. And as you can see, uh, over a pretty long period of time, uh, these data indicate not much change. Uh, Vietnam is really the only country that shows any kind of upward trend, and that's associated with its early uh, liberalization uh, experience. <clears throat> In terms of aggregate exports, the skilled to unskilled labor ratio in value added hasn't changed a whole lot from 1995 through to the end of this data series in 2011. I want to now uh, kind of dig down one level because Thailand is a country for which we have a lot of data. And Thailand is one of the countries that is often cited as a kind of a case study in GVC participation and the benefits of that, uh, specifically, although not exclusively, the Thai uh, automobile industry, which is you know, an export success, no doubt about that. So these are data from the World Bank's uh, international trade series. Uh, these were data compiled by my graduate student, Varun uh, uh, Kidiat Bakon, who is, uh, I think, uh, one of the participants here today. And what these show is uh, for the two digit level, they're aggregated up from six digit data, but uh, aggregating up to two digit level, we're looking here again at the uh, skill intensity of exports from Thailand uh, in the uh, industry classifications that account for the largest share of total uh, merchandise trade from Thailand. And uh, uh, whether we're looking at textiles, garments and footwear, or whether we're looking at machinery, electrical, uh, electronic, automobiles, parts of automobiles, uh, what we see is over a 30 year period, 
almost no change, pretty much flatlining in terms of human capital intensity of exports. Whereas the, the more uh, optimistic view of global value chain participation has should have these uh, human capital input levels rising over time. If they're not rising, then we have to ask the question, well, just how much know-how is being created or is being transferred uh, and why isn't it showing up in these export data? Uh, interestingly, the only uh, industry that does show significant increase in human capital intensity in Thailand, the very bottom dark blue line is the rubber industry, but that's also the one that's kind of least, I think, connected to global value chains. So this is moving up from uh, exports of raw rubber products to rubber gloves and condoms and other things like that. Uh, uh, something that Thailand does very well, but it's a pretty small part of their total export story. So a little bit pessimistic uh, based on the evidence, okay, the evidence is not that complete, uh, but this evidence doesn't point very conclusively towards the kind of skills upgrading that 30 years of global value chain participation in Thailand should have expected us to produce. Uh, let me now turn with the uh, remaining time that I have uh, to the question of education. So if uh, GVC participation leads to human capital accumulation, that's great. Uh, that's the aspiration that we have and the hope, I guess, that we have. And of course, human capital investments are uh, absolutely essential to resilient and sustainable long run growth in the developing world. So how well does, uh, does GVC participation play into this story? Uh, obviously, uh, lower income econ economies have exploited their uh, abundant blue collar labor to join global value chains. And this has had uh, pretty clearly had uh, two kinds of effects. First of all, income effects, uh, higher income leads to higher education, higher, greater spending on education by households and by governments as well. That's a positive effect. But at the same time, we know that specialization in blue collar industrial activities has had a negative effect through uh, relative price effects. That is that the relative demand for blue collar labor, at least until now in countries like uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Indonesia, maybe even Thailand as well, uh, the relative price effect has been to depress returns to skills by increasing demand for blue collar labor faster than the demand for skilled labor. So that's a, that's a negative effect that pushes back on any positive effects from uh, income growth. And of course, uh, as uh, Murray already highlighted, there are going to be interactions with mobility in the labor market as well. Uh, the least mobile households in the labor market are the ones least able to take advantage of global value chain uh, based growth. Uh, let me skip the demographic story. Um, so, uh, so let me uh, pull in some data from Vietnam for the next three slides to highlight the kind of concerns that I have. Uh, the first of these uh, is a set of estimates from a, uh, a study by Duan and Gibson, uh, but reinforced by lots of other studies as well, that's, that indicate pretty clearly and pretty robustly that returns to education, returns to schooling in Vietnam peaked uh, at about 10% per year of education in a, around about the same time that Vietnam joined the WTO, that is around about, w, around about uh, 2008. Uh, since then, they've declined by these estimates of by about 40% in a pretty short period of time. And of course, these are overall returns. Uh, if we look only at domestic private sector activity, then the peak returns were much lower than this, about half, and have certainly not risen as well. So uh, a great deal of what we see here is driven by increased supply of skills. There's no question of that. But another part of that is driven by uh, specialization in blue collar activities. Uh, raising, as I said, the returns to blue collar uh, earnings relative to those for skilled workers. And so that's clearly had a depressing effect on the uh, skill premium in Vietnam. What does this mean for, uh, for investments in skills? Well, uh, that's one component of the uh, set of signals that children receive when they're making decisions about whether to stay in school or to leave school once they reach working age and join the, uh, uh, the low skill labor force. Now, these are data, uh, again, from Vietnam, that suggests that the intensity of FDI employment uh, at a district level, uh, something which is an indicator not only of uh, work jobs in FDI industries, but also, of course, for the two or three jobs, additional jobs that are created every for every FDI job uh, that is invested, 
these data suggest that uh, both for young men and for young women, especially in urban areas, there's a pretty strong negative association between uh, increasing intensity of FDI employment and the propensity to uh, stay in school. So what these negative bars show uh, is that for a one standard deviation increase in the share of FDI employment in any given district, we get for uh, 16 and 17 year old boys, a two to 3% lower uh, percentage point, lower rate of enrollment in school, and for girls, uh, a four to five percent lower uh, uh, rate of enrollment in schools. So that's a pretty serious drop. And if we look at uh, uh, econometric this, I won't spend time on this uh, 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 on this exercise. We see again that even after we control for the positive effects of higher per capita income, lower poverty, uh, we still find a very strong uh, effect from the labor market, which is basically a demand signal, which says, if you're not doing that well in school, or if your family is not that wealthy that they can keep you in school, then uh, maybe when you hit 15, 16, uh, it's time to drop out and join the labor market. And that may be an issue uh, going forward, because this will be not just the current generation, but it will also be transmitted uh, as these children become parents to their children as well. So I think uh, on the whole, uh, we have a, uh, we have a, a, some pretty good reasons to doubt the resilience of the uh, transmission uh, from global value chain activity to increases in human capital, and I worry a little about it about that. Uh, it's true that all of the assessments of development gains in the long run from global value chain participation are very conditional. Uh, here's a quote from the World Bank's World Development Report, a uh, typical uh, statement of this kind, I think. Uh, everything would be just great if developing countries implement deeper reforms, and that if, I think, I think is the, the, the set of details in which the devil uh, will be found. Um, so lower transfer rates of uh, know-how, uh, exclusion of less mobile groups, uh, diminished returns to educational investments. I think all of these are threats to sustained growth, to resilient and indeed inclusive growth uh, for countries that are relatively low income and are uh, relying on global value chain activity to support longer term uh, economic development. So uh, let me conclude with a few uh, indicators in the direction of policy. Uh, first of all, uh, it's true that we don't have any really good generalizable lessons from experience. Uh, second, uh, there's now an increasing body of work which suggests that intervening in the labor market, uh, active labor market policies, upskilling programs have had really very low returns uh, relative to expectations. This is true in RCTs that have been surveyed by David McKenzie and also I think in uh, real life experience. Um, it's also true, and I think the Thailand experience points us in this direction, that relying on uh, uh, global value chain participation to kind of automatically uh, lead to broader and deeper forms of activity in skill intensive industries, that doesn't seem to be an automatic process, it's going to need a push from policy. And then lastly, let me throw out a maybe controversial idea, and that is that uh, one of the things that's clearly lacking in low income countries is the skill base that's necessary for uh, more skill intensive industries to expand. Uh, waiting for those skills to be produced through the education system might be kind of a long haul. And so maybe we should be looking back at another uh, global value chain uh, in uh, economy, Singapore, in the 1980s, which embarked on a very, very ambitious and very, very uh, far reaching uh, program of essentially uh, GVC oriented industrialization. And one of the things that they did in there was massive imports of skilled labor from the rest of the world, uh, increasing the, the, uh, the numbers of skilled workers in, uh, in, in Singapore between 1980 and 2000 from about, uh, I think from about 80,000 to about 290,000. So I think these are the kinds of possibilities that uh, developing countries in the lower income reaches now need to be considering at least as interim measures uh, while they create the conditions for massive uh, educational upgrading within their own populations. Uh, thank you, Cicero. I, I went a little over time, I apologize, but I'm done now. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, between the three of you, you have covered a huge range of uh, issues, but I think the basic trust is uh, very clear. Um, on the one hand, trade uh, is really critical uh, 
to growth and development uh, and critical to any strategy for uh, recovery from not just the pandemic, but uh, overall recovery in, in the world economy and uh, the achievement of uh, green, resilient, uh, sustainable, uh, inclusive, uh, you know, all of that uh, development. But it also, I think uh, the presentation also pointed out all the complexities of uh, this process. Uh, there are the political challenges, and uh, there are the distributional issues, and there are the transitional uh, issues of how to move from a world where, uh, where we are now and how to move uh, to get to a more sustainable path. Uh, so we have had a bunch of um, uh, Q&A questions as well, but uh, maybe I just give uh, Mari a couple of minutes to respond very briefly to any issues that Kim and Ian raised in their presentations, if you want to, and then uh, move on to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, I'd rather hear a question from the audience, but just very briefly. Uh... Just to say, I agree <laughs> uh, with uh, Kim and, and Ian. I mean, they supplemented in, in more detail some of the issues. I totally agree that agriculture uh, is, is key uh, given its contribution to greenhouse gas emission as well as poverty and job creation. And obviously uh, transformations in the agriculture system uh, and land use, food and land use uh, is, is key. And it's one of the key uh, challenges for us uh, how do we design policies that will uh, a uh, allow uh, agriculture to be part of this sustainable supply chain, and then b as part of this green, resilient, and inclusive development? You know, uh, we are trying to work with countries, for instance, to design uh, the, the way they will uh, approach agriculture, like food and land use, like uh, land restoration, uh, restoration of degraded lands. I think is a very good uh, program uh, that we are trying to do in, in, in many countries where you have what we call a triple win. It's, a stim it's part of the stimulus that will uh, create jobs. Uh, and, and at the same time, the ones that are working on uh, the degraded lands are the ones that the farmers who will uh, end up hopefully have better land use. Uh, and then you also supplement it with sustainable agriculture practices, repurpose your, your uh, agriculture subsidies uh, and then you will also have the, the win of more increased productivity and sustainability. So that those are, I think, the kind of uh, thinking that we have to uh, have. And I agree with you, there's still a lot, a lot of trade distortions uh, and subsidies uh, that need to be addressed at the national as well as at the global level. Just for your information, uh, the OECD, WTO, World Bank, IMF, we are actually uh, trying to put a compilation of all subsidies, not just agriculture, uh, just to, to understand uh, this whole issue of subsidies and, and how we, we should be addressing it. So you made a point about how we need to you know, get a handle of this and make sure uh, that, they, that they are reduced and some of them were introduced during the crisis response. How do we uh, deal with that? Uh, and on uh, for uh, Ian, uh, <laughs> Yes, you are very pessimistic in, in all the, the policies that you, you were saying. Some works and some uh, cost a, a lot and, and maybe uh, inconclusive in terms of the, of the outcome. Uh, and, and how do you deal with the, the latecomers and the low-income countries? I think we need to sort of think uh, ahead in terms of the role of disruption. You know, if, if, um, I think supply chains are going to change and evolve. And uh, you don't have to be the whole part of it. You you have to un, you have to figure out which part. It could be services. It could be something very specialized uh, that you you are part of, and that can uh, allow leapfrogging uh, for some of the low income countries and latecomers. Uh, but it's not something that's easily done without uh, you know policies that will allow you to have the infrastructure, uh, the connectivity, and the skills. Uh, I, I do totally agree with you, though, on the importing of um, skills that you don't have. Uh, I think, what's his name? Richard, uh, Ricardo Hausman, he uh, has this complexity uh, measurement, right? And Indonesia, he did a study for Indonesia, and it came out that we, we only 
we don't have very many complex products. And we had a very, very low ratio of foreign uh, workers compared to the total workers, because we do have a very restrictive policies on uh, importing talent. I, I do agree that it's that's the really fast way. And, and you actually will lead to innovation uh, and create a lot of uh, creativity if you allow, uh, if, if, if you can allow talent to move where, uh, where they should go. Um, I might, uh, thanks, uh, Maria. I, I might, I, I'm going to consolidate some of the, uh, the Q&A questions uh, given the time constraint. We have only a few minutes uh, more at most. Uh, and the, I think the one issue is the transition from where we are. Um, so one question says, okay, and in, in the past, <coughs> we have had a lot of uh, trade growth. And countries, uh, you know, like China, became the factories of the world. Um, in, you know, and to some lesser extent, I guess Vietnam and and so on. They exploited comparative advantage uh, in in particular, uh, particularly unskilled labor. And now uh, they are confronted with uh, the challenge of actually moving beyond that to producing green goods, a more sustainable way which should mean uh, different technologies, uh, different skill sets, et cetera. And that, you know, how, how would value chains uh, be reconstituted uh, in order to uh, make that transition? You know, what are the costs of doing that? What are the strategies for uh, doing that? So that's one set of questions. Uh, then there's another set of questions about uh, the global trading system, uh, which, um, uh, example, uh, Mia Mikik, uh, previously at SCAP, has uh, raised this question, which several other questions also relate to. Uh, the world trading system has become weaker. The multilateral system has become weaker. We are getting fewer and fewer uh, agreements. Um, current agreements are getting weaker, not stronger. Uh, so how can the system actually uh, uh, somehow be revived uh, to meet the, the many challenges uh, that were outlined uh, in uh, Mari's presentation, as well as uh, the issues raised in uh, by, by uh, Kim and Ian. Uh, maybe Mari, you can go first and I'll ask. Yeah. Not easy questions to answer. So I'm counting on Kim and, and Ian to help me answer this. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think yes, it's a it's a it's a big challenge uh, this transition to green, but uh, basically it's no longer uh, I think a choice, but uh, it's 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 a reality. Uh, and we are as as we are working with countries, for instance, even Indonesia, like Turkey, those who are exporting to Europe, actually they're already facing it, right? Because it's oh we're gonna face CBAM. Uh, now it's been delayed to 26. It was 23 before. So they were already thinking, okay, how do how do we uh, how do we have carbon pricing? How do we uh, make sure that we can track the carbon and so on and so forth? So uh, it's it's already uh, I think uh, companies at the at, at the kind of the real uh, trading level, it's already happening. And we know that investment decisions today are being driven. You know, companies are having net zero targets. So they also have to comply or, or look for uh, locations of production where they can actually be green. So like, I just give you a concrete example. Tesla was trying to figure out where they should be producing their electric uh, cars. Was it Indonesia or India? And uh, it was basically a link to whether you had renewable energy or not uh, for them. And it had to be 100% totally uh, renewable energy or they wouldn't go there. So that you already have to have the long-term strategy of your energy transition, for instance. So I, I think it's it's no longer a question, but it's it's how do I, as a country, best um, attract the, this uh, new green investment and its opportunities. But the difficulty is again, just like you had displacement because of um, of in the past because of uh, competition. Now uh, you also will have displacement because of green transition, you know, like you can take the coal miners or the, or the areas which benefited from coal. How do you deal with that? 
So we actually uh, propose a just transit. Just transition has to be people at the center and just transition needs to be central in the policies that we design. And it's quite country specific uh, and so on. So it's, 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 I think it's a big challenge. Uh, I'll leave it at there. Um, and I think on the world trading system, I couldn't agree uh, with uh, uh, with you more on that. Uh, it was, who was it asking uh, the, the, from Angtad? Mia. I'm oh, sorry, uh, yeah. Mia, Mia, okay. Uh, from uh, SCAC, right? Yeah, uh, Mia was asking that. I, and obviously that's the question uppermost in our minds too. And I, I just came from the G20 trade ministers meeting and there was a, like trying to rally, uh, you know, a strong support for a good outcome at the, at the, at, at the MC12. Uh, it's, I don't think we're quite there yet, uh, but uh, we will need to, to continue to, to rally that uh, without a strong uh, multilateral trading system, a lot of the issues like subsidies, you can't deal with subsidies uh, with a bilateral or a regional agreement. It can only be dealt with with a multilateral agreement. <clears throat> Trade and environment, I think, similarly needs a multilateral uh, agreement, not, not bilateral, and you're going to end up with I don't know, a, a new spaghetti bowl. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I, I think uh, we, we need to, we need to uh, continue the rally to make sure that we can get back to a, uh, what, what, it, what is now called a more relevant uh, WTO for the 21st century, which we need to deal with the uh, ongoing issues such as agriculture subsidies and make sure the dispute settlement uh, mechanism is uh, strengthened again, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. is still saying we need to resolve the long-standing issues, and it'd be good if they could actually specify what are the long-standing issues, and then everybody will come in and try to fix these long-standing issues. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, they, they will be able to come around uh, on that one. But at the same time, I also believe that we can continue with the regional agreements, uh, whether it's CPTPP or RCEP, uh, increasingly, they are having uh, the 21st century relevant issues like digital, like environment, uh, and they tend to be, they can catalyze um, uh, the discussions that hopefully will end up also in the multilateral negotiations. So I guess I'm more optimistic uh, than I, than, than what maybe the reality is, but I think we just have to keep on pushing. Yes, I think uh, the transition to green is really a continuation of uh, global development uh, where we have the transition out of agriculture and then more recently in more advanced countries, the transition out of manufacturing. And the, the way to smooth that process is uh, by investing more in human capital, uh, the issue that Ian focused on. Um, and so I think... Uh, that just underscores the need for that to be a very major part of uh, investments going forward. On Mia's question about the WTO, obviously it hasn't uh, worked well in recent times uh, and uh, that is a great challenge, uh, but I think the challenge will increase because of uh, this move to become greener. Uh, if, uh, for example, the EU does uh, implement strictly its uh, carbon border tax adjustment mechanism and other countries are slow to increase their taxes or other means of reducing emissions, then um, uh, that will disrupt trade and bring a real challenge to the WTO, adding to the other challenges it has. Um, so getting uh, countries to uh, adopt um, good green policies is uh, going to be key to reduce that uh, risk to the, the trading system. Uh, and it's a bit disappointing to hear that we may not see the heads of uh, China, Russia and India at, uh, in Glasgow, if that's the case. That's the three biggest emitters out there that we won't have uh, uh, at the table, which uh, does bring a, a further challenge to that meeting. Yeah, very quickly, I guess, uh, and taking these in reverse order, that I'm encouraged by the extent to which behind the border measures have become standard in uh, so-called new trade agreements. And uh, uh, if we think back just maybe, I don't know, not even, not even 20 years, uh, the idea of having environmental or, or other conditions as riders in, uh, in regional trade agreements was pretty, un pretty much unheard of still or very rare. Now I think it's becoming standard. And I think that uh, countries for both 
uh, trade related reasons, they want to be in the agreement. And also because the idea of environmental damage is no longer an abstract concept, but a very real one to them, uh, showing much greater willingness to accept those kind of provisions and perhaps to uh, even accept provisions with real teeth as we go forward. So uh, whether that happens through the WTO or not is impossible to predict, but certainly in regional agreements, I think it's becoming much more standard. I like that. I like the way that that's happening. Uh, let me uh, uh, not use up any more of the audience's time, Cicero, and hand back to you. You're muted, Cicero. Sorry. Thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, given the time, uh, you know, we should bring and this particular webinar to a close, but uh, you know, I think Mari and uh, Kim and Ian, uh, you've done a wonderful job of uh, presenting the big picture and, and uh, also some of the nuances of, and the challenges uh, that uh, confront us going forward. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, you all end on, you know, some degree of optimism, uh, not just, uh, uh highlighting the challenges but uh, also uh giving us reason for hope uh, and for the sake of all humanity i hope that uh, your optimism is justified uh, and that uh, the audience here uh is better informed today and uh, would be more active in pushing this agenda forward uh for the sake of everyone uh, thanks very much again uh, for the speakers and the participants, uh, and we look forward to uh, meeting you again uh, at future webinars and hopefully in person soon too. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.